on the presence of the most blessed of all sacraments, in the presence of our Lord's substantial, real, abiding, and corporal presence in the blessed tabernacle, and with his kind permission, I want to begin this final mission conference with a reading from St. John's Apocalypse. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And there was seen another sign in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. And the woman brought forth a child who was to rule all nations with an iron rod, and her son was taken up to God and to his throne. Again, words taken from St. John's Apocalypse. On New Year's Eve, in the year 1916, a party was held in honor of a very wicked, evil man. This evil man had falsely portrayed himself as being a Christian mystic, even some sort of holy monk. But in reality, this man was a deviant, seducing innocent women and pretending to be a guru, but he was a false guru. And as a result of this bad influence, this wolf in sheep's clothing gained further and further power and influence within the royal family of Russia. The leaders of this empire at the time, the Tsar and his wife, the Tsarina, were completely taken in by this supposed holy man who was named Rasputin especially because he had supposed powers to heal their son and future czar of Russia who suffered from hemophilia. It seemed that Rasputin was able to stop the flow of blood, to stop the hemorrhaging within the boy and therefore save his life, but he could never heal the child, only could stop the flow of blood for a time. But he still gained influence as a result over the royal family of Russia and combine this with the horrible effects of the First World War, it seemed as if poor Russia and its dynasty, its Christian ruling class, was going to be destroyed. That New Year's Eve party was actually a trap. A trap set for Rasputin. The food and drink given to this false monk was heavily laced with doses of cyanide. But as they fed Rasputin more and more poison, they found him to be completely unaffected. Next, they would try guns. The friends and patriots of Russia would try guns. They shot Rasputin right through the heart. He fell, but there was no blood, and he continued to breathe. Within minutes, Rasputin arose again, and he began to roar and behave like a beast, and he tried to sneak out the side door. Four more shots rang out, one hitting him right through the neck, another through the shoulder. But he still lived. Soon the assassins began to take furniture, canes, anything they could grab, and to beat Rasputin over and over again. But he still lived. It's as if he couldn't die. Eventually, they took Rasputin and they wrapped him in a sheet, and they threw him into an icy river right outside the house. The next morning, as the body of Rasputin was found, having been pulled from the river, it was found to be completely encased in ice. But strangely enough, the lungs of the body were filled with water, and an arm was reaching upwards, telling us that Rasputin was still alive in the water, trying to breathe and escape. The Catholic historian, God rest his soul, Dr. Warren Carroll, one of the founders of Christendom College, Dr. Warren Carroll claims that Rasputin was most likely possessed by demons and that there is no clearer example of demonic possession affecting the outcome of world events. And furthermore, that great Irish priest I mentioned earlier, the great lover of Christ the King, Father Dennis Fay, he claimed that Rasputin was actually recruited by Freemasonry and bankrolled by revolutionary groups in order to purposely bring disorder to Russia and to topple the Tsar from his throne. Because what followed after Rasputin's death was the assassination of the Tsar, his wife, and every one of their children. A Christian nation, a 
nation with a certain Christian order where Christ reigned would soon become an atheistic nation when the Bolsheviks took power in the year 1917. The communist revolution and the rise of a godless and Christless culture is considered the most important secular event in the 20th century. But during the exact same time, during the exact same time in that year 1917, just months before the Russian Revolution, the Blessed Mother appeared at a place called Fatima, Portugal, to three shepherd children in a valley called the Cova da Ira. And the Mother of God spoke to a 10-year-old girl named Lucia, as well as her two cousins, a nine-year-old boy named Francisco, and yes, a seven-year-old girl named Jacinta. And, of course, she spoke to them on the 13th day of the month, between May and October of 1917. The Queen of Heaven, the Queen of the Most Holy Rosary, provided a formula. She provided a formula for peace and a saving prescription that would bring about the triumph of her Immaculate Heart and the reign of Christ the King in the minds and hearts and ultimately the nations of men. The formula for peace, the formula for peace and the triumph of Jesus, Mary, and Holy Church began simply with the recitation of the Most Holy Rosary. This is what the Queen instructed her little three subjects. She said, say the rosary every day in order to obtain peace for the world and an end to the war. And furthermore, she encouraged them. She encouraged them to do penances in order to make sacrifices for sinners that they might be saved from the fires of hell. And Our Lady spoke of her special role in crushing Satan's unjust tyranny. And the key to true peace and human salvation is Marian devotion. Consecration, in fact, of Russia and every single human person to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Now, on July 13th, 1917, those three loyal subjects of the Queen would have their third audience. But this apparition proved to be a most dire warning because it included a horrible vision of hell itself filled with countless souls. You see, if the Queen's formula for the reign of peace were not followed, many souls would be damned and a worse war, and greater sufferings would result, and it would occur during the pontificate of Pope Pius XI, the author of Quas Primas, Christ the King. Our Lady stated, If you suddenly see a bright, unknown light one night, know that this is a sign from God, which he is giving you to let you know that he is going to punish the world for its sins again. This light in the night sky did occur in Europe in the year 1938, just days before Adolf Hitler invaded Austria in what is known as the Anschluss. And the continued stubborn resistance of men to this plan of peace, both within the world and in the church, would lead to spread of Russia's errors, her revolutionary errors, bringing greater chaos and yes, disorder to mankind. In other words, the continued rejection of Christ's kingship and Mary's reign as queen would mean their further absence and withdrawal, leaving men to suffer the horrible consequences. Now, after being put in a jail by a Masonic Portuguese official during the month of August, the children would be visited by the mother of God three more times, including that famous final visit on October 13, 1917. And to prove that Our Lady had truly visited her subjects and that her message was real, a miracle from heaven would be provided for all to see that would rival and, yes, surpass the actual splitting of the Red Sea by Moses in the book of Exodus. The children, it is said, knelt to pray at 
the Holy Rosary with their queen on that day, during a torrential downpour at the Cova da Era. And all of a sudden, during this rainfall, Lucia, Francisco, and yes, Jacinta, and 70,000 other people were able to witness a supernatural and cataclysmic event. Allow me, if you will, to read a description of the miracle written in a Portuguese revolutionary Masonic newspaper known for its virulent anti-Catholicism. This is an atheistic point of view. The chief editor of that paper wrote the following, quote, We saw the huge crowd turn towards the sun when it appeared at its zenith. It resembled a flat plate of silver, and it was possible to stare at it without the least discomfort. Before the dazzled eyes of the people, the sun trembled. It made strange and abrupt movements outside of all cosmic laws. In short, the sun danced. And eventually the witnesses tell us the sun raced towards the earth as if to crash into it, only then to return to its original spot. Not only were the people now safe from harm, but they found that all of their rain-soaked and mud-soaked clothing was completely dry and completely clean. Now, to begin this conference, I read to you from the Apocalypse of St. John about a woman clothed with a sun with a crown of 12 stars around her head. Queen of heaven, queen of earth, queen of angels, and queen of all men. But in that same Bible passage, I also read to you and made mention of a red dragon, a reptile, a serpent-like creature. You know, the God of peace, the God of peace who brings peace to men, the God of peace has established only one enemy relationship in creation, and he did so at the very beginning. After the fall of Adam and Eve, God spoke the following, quote, I will put enmity, I will put an enemy relationship between you, serpent, and the woman, between your offspring, serpent, and her offspring. And that enmity is obviously between Satan and our Blessed Mother. It is between the unjust usurper and the queen, and it's between his offspring because he has offspring spiritually, and her offspring. And this irreconcilable feud will go on until the end of time, and it will only increase in intensity as the years pass. Listen to that. Not only has this enmity been established from the beginning, but it will only increase as each year passes. Case in point. Sister Lucia, one of the visionaries at Fatima, she stated the following back in 1957. Sister Lucia said, quote, The Most Holy Virgin has told me that the devil is about to engage in a decisive battle against the Virgin. Not too long ago, I ran across an interview given by a Cardinal Carlo Caffara. He's from Bologna, Italy. And in the interview, Cardinal Caffara spoke of a correspondence that he had with Sister Lucia regarding this very point, this decisive battle. What is this decisive battle? The Cardinal received a handwritten note back from Sister Lucia. Not a typed written, but a handwritten note. In it, we find the following. Lucia says... The final battle between the Lord and the reign of Satan will be about marriage and the family. Don't be afraid, Sister Lucia adds, because anyone who works for the holiness of marriage and family will be opposed in every way. Because this is the decisive issue. And then she concluded, however, Our Lady has already crushed its head. We can have confidence. I'm reminded, too, of that approved apparition of Our Lady of Good Success in a place called Quito, Ecuador. 
This is back in the 1600s, centuries ago. Our Lady infallibly predicted, infallibly prophesied our modern age. She now speaks of the 20th century, and she's speaking in 1600. She says the following in this apparition, key to Ecuador, Lady Good Success, quote, The passions will erupt, and there will be a total corruption of morals. As for the sacrament of matrimony, our Blessed Mother speaking, which symbolizes the union of Christ and his church, it will be attacked and deeply profaned. Then she mentions, again, prophecy, Freemasonry. The official founding date of Freemasonry is 1717. This is the 1600s. Freemasonry will then be in power and will enact iniquitous laws which aim at doing away with this sacrament of matrimony, making it easy for everyone to live in sin and encouraging procreation of illegitimate children born without the blessing of the church, unquote. And then the Blessed Mother adds this ominous statement, one that seems so true, especially today. It is at this supreme moment of need in the church that the one who should speak will fall silent. Yes, we clerics, we who are ministers of the Holy Gospel, we have fallen silent. We spoke out a bit over the issues of separation and divorce in the past, but eventually we retreated in silence. Canon law clearly states that a Catholic couple choosing to permanently separate need to obtain their bishop's permission, yet few, if any, ever follow this condition. Before the Second Vatican Council, the amount of annulments granted each year in our country equaled 300 in number. Today, decrees of nullity have skyrocketed in this country to the level of 50,000 or more a year. We cowered before the world and failed to shepherd the faithful regarding the issue of the contraceptive mentality. Humani Vitae was very late in coming, and when it did arrive on the scene, it was dead on arrival. We then whimpered over things like cohabitation, infidelity, and company keeping. We were afraid of the woman's movement and the power of the feminist ideology, and so we gave in to the modern mindset and were quiet about the biblical imperative that wives ought to be submissive to their husbands. And with the abomination of the sodomitical culture around us, with that abomination now legalized and heavily promoted, many Catholic clerics are being swept along in this modern wave of impurity. And we are accepting or at least tolerating a sin that the Bible says is one of the four that cry to heaven for vengeance. And finally, with the notion of this decisive battle between the devil and Our Lady, between the church and a false counter-church, especially a battle over marriage and family, we are all deeply disappointed, for sure, with recent synods and documents on marriage and family, which are at best confusing, at worst scandalous to the faithful. A decisive battle is presently being fought between the serpent and the woman, between Satan and Our Lady of Fatima, and it has a lot to do with marriage and family. That is the decisive battle. And during this decisive battle, we must choose a side to be on. That camp in which we have traditional Catholic morality to follow. We must follow the banner and standard of Christ. We must be under the white mantle of our Blessed Mother. We must be in the camp of Saints Peter and Paul and all the apostles. Our Lady of Fatima, our Lady of Fatima told the three seers not only to pray the Holy Rosary, not only to come to visit her on the 13th day of the month, but she also told them to learn how to read. They were illiterate. 
Our blessed mother said, learn how to read to become equipped and educated, at least in some small way, for this battle. If there is confusion in our times, if many statements seem to be ambiguous or even unsound, then we need to read traditional writings. Read books whose authors' names begin with S. St. Alphonsus, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Catherine of Siena. Let's begin there. We need to read the writings of saints, doctors, and the infallible doctrinal statements found in resources like the documents of the Council of Trent, the Denziger book. Read what the church has always taught. And yes, we must call upon those holy witnesses, those holy saints who have made sacrifices for the defense of marriage. It's extraordinary how many saints have died because of marriage, including one particular girl I read about, a girl named Blessed Laura Vacunia. Laura Vacunia was born in a place called Santiago, Chile, in the late 19th century. Laura Vacunia's father was named Joseph, and he was a very accomplished military officer and came from a good family and was part of the aristocracy. Laura's mother was named Mercedes, and she was a simple country peasant girl who had fallen in love with a man in uniform. When Laura was still very young, a revolution and a civil war broke out in Chile that forced her family to go into exile. And being in political exile made life very challenging and most difficult for the family. But things got even more difficult when Laura's father, Joseph Acuna, suddenly died. Mercedes Acuna, the mother of the family, was now a widow. And Laura was now an orphan, at least without a father. They would escape further away from the revolution in Chile by heading all the way to Argentina. And there, Mercedes, the mother, hoped to find some work in order to help with raising the girls. The desperate widow then made a most terrible choice. Mercedes had met a man named Manuel Mora, who owned a large ranch. An immoral agreement was made where Senor Mora would agree to provide a house and some supplies for the mother, Laura, and her older sister, but in exchange, Mercedes would agree to act as the public mistress of Mr. Mora. With her tuition being paid for by Senor Mora, Laura would eventually be sent off to a good Catholic school where she was taught the holy faith by the sisters. And Laura began to thrive academically in this environment. She loved the sisters very much, and she enjoyed attending the holy sacrifice of the Mass. She would enjoy going to confession. She would make regular visits to the Eucharistic Lord in the tabernacle, and she called the tabernacle Jesus' little house. In fact, when Laura was first told that Jesus always lived in the tabernacle, she blew him a kiss and promised to make visits to him often. Being in such a good boarding school and being inspired by the sisters to become a religious herself not only brought her greater love for God, but a greater love for neighbor. Laura became a friend to all of the other students, and she was always the first to volunteer for chores. She was the perfect peacemaker in the dormitory. And many described Laura as being serious about life and wise beyond her years. She even had a mature understanding of prayer and brought a joyful spirit of piety wherever she went. As Laura once observed, she said, Wherever I am, school, at play, or anyone else, the thought of God accompanies me, helps me, and consoles me. But after the school year was over, Laura would have to return to that bad environment of Senor Mora's hacienda. Laura had taken catechism classes. She had studied the commandments. She began to realize what was going on. 
She knew that her mother was not living the right kind of life and that she was in trouble and she would not be happy unless this was corrected. During her first summer vacation from school, Laura began to experience the unwanted advances of Senor Mora. Drunk with whiskey, the master of the house would try to embrace and kiss Laura, but she was repelled by his behavior and sought to stay very far away from him. When she was only 11 years old, Laura would receive her first Holy Communion. But at this most important event of her young life, she noticed that her mother did not come to the altar rail to receive. The young daughter realized just how unhappy her mother was. And so she went before the tabernacle of Jesus and Laura prayed, Jesus, I wish that mama would know you better and be happy. After receiving the most blessed of all sacraments, Laura was further strengthened by grace and began to ponder seriously the religious life as a consecrated sister. Laura would say to others around her, I want to do all I can to make God known and loved. My God, I want to love you and serve you all the days of my life. So when Laura returned to school, she was able to speak to a visiting bishop about becoming a religious sister. The good bishop encouraged her, but told her that she would have to wait until she was a bit older. She was also told by her confessor that her call, her vocation to the religious life was real, it was genuine, but they would have to be kept secret. But when she got a bit older and did ask the sisters to be admitted to the order, Laura was told that it was not proper, at this time at least, seeing that her mother was living a public life of scandal as the mistress of Senor Mora. On another visit home, Laura was once again approached by this drunken Senor Mora. He tried to take her into his arms, and she struggled ferociously and ran outside the home and maintained her holy purity. During a special fiesta held at the local village a few days later, again, Senor Mora and his unwanted advances were made known. He asked Laura to dance with him, and she flatly refused. The lustful man grew enraged and sought revenge. Laura was forced to hide outside the house until dark, while Mr. Mora vented his rage upon his mistress. The evil man then refused to pay for any more schooling for Laura. But the good sisters, hearing about the situation, took Laura back in. And during that school year, Laura received the sacrament of confirmation. Further spiritual strengthening, further sacramental character and grace within her. And Laura began to embrace martyrdom. Martyrdom. She realized that she had not yet made the supreme sacrifice for her mother. Laura then begged her confessor. She's 12 years old. She begged her confessor that she be allowed to offer her life to God for the conversion of her mother. The priest, seeing the tremendous spiritual gifts present in this penitent, gave Laura permission to make the offering of her life. And so in the winter of 1903, her martyrdom began. God answered her prayer. Laura became very, very ill. Even a return home to a more healthy climate and good air around the ranch did her no good. Her mother was saddened, but Senor Mora still had his lustful eyes upon Laura. Mercedes noted this and soon took Laura and her sister away from the ranch and moved into the local village. But on the night of January 14th, 1904, a drunk Senor Mora, filled with anger and lust, rode into the village on horseback. And with a whip in his hand, he barged into the cottage where Mercedes and the girls were staying. He demanded that his quote-unquote family return to its hacienda. But Laura would have absolutely nothing to do with this. She would not have her mother return to that life again. And so despite her great sickness, Laura Vicuña walked right out the door of that cottage 
Laura then tried to run to the local sister's convent, but was quickly caught by Senor Mora. Senor Mora then began to whip her and then kicked her repeatedly as she lay upon the ground crying for help. Laura had been beaten unconscious and she was left in the streets of her village. She would then hang on to life for another week, being watched over by her mother and by her sister. The priest was called in to give the final sacraments, including a good confession, where Laura clearly stated that she forgave her attacker and bore him no ill will. When Laura and her younger sister were alone, Laura made a series of requests that she wanted her sister to write down. Laura stated, Sister, be good to Mama. Don't give her any trouble. Respect her always. Don't ever leave her alone, even if later on you will have a family of your own. Don't look down upon the poor. Be kind to them. Love our Lord and the Blessed Virgin. Pray every day to your guardian angel to keep you from sin. And don't forget, Julia, my sister, we will be together in heaven. Finally, just before she passed away from this world to heaven, Laura revealed her little secret to her mother. Laura was only able to whisper, so her mother leaned very close to her lips. Laura then said, Mama, I'm dying, but I am happy to offer my life for you. I asked our Lord for this exact thing. Stunned. Amazed, confounded by this statement from her daughter, Mercedes, the mother, fell to her knees and sobbed uncontrollably. She realized exactly what her daughter meant and begged Laura's forgiveness as well as the forgiveness of God for living in sin with Senor Mora. She promised to begin her life again. Blessed Blessed Laura Vicuña was beatified in March of 1988, and she is a patron for all those who suffer abuse within the family. And during the Holy Mass, during that ceremony, the Holy Father referred to Laura as, quote, the Eucharistic flower of the Andes, whose life was a poem of purity, sacrifice, and filial love. Now, I must admit that I had never heard of Laura Vicuña or the details of her life or martyrdom. I'd only heard about her life due to her being invoked in a letter signed by a good archbishop from a place called Astanya, Pakistan, and his auxiliary bishop, the well-known and well-admired Most Reverend Athanasius Snyder. Blessed Laura Vicuña, along with St. John the Baptist, St. John Fisher, St. Thomas More, were all being invoked because they have all died for marriage, for the indissolubility of marriage. They're all saintly witnesses to defend marriage. And they're all called upon to intercede for marriage and its indissolubility, that it be protected from errors and confusion caused by recent papal statements and documents, as well as various immoral pastoral practices being instituted officially in various dioceses regarding the sacraments of confession and Holy Communion being made available to those in objectively illicit unions. Once again, we are hearing the words of some faithful bishops which are the words of St. John the Baptist and other saintly witnesses who are saying, non licet, it is not lawful that thou shalt commit adultery. The letter in question then lists a number of non-negotiables. For example, quote, that relations between persons not bound by a valid marriage, which is the case of divorced, remarried, is always contrary to the will of God and is a grave offense to God. Blessed 
Laura Vacunia would agree with the other non-negotiables mentioned in the letter, including that moral imperative that, quote, it is not morally lawful to have relations with someone who is not the rightful spouse in order to avoid another sin. Indeed, the Word of God teaches that it is not lawful to do evil so that good may come of it. The bishops then added that, quote, no circumstance, no circumstance, not even one that may lessen accountability or guilt, can ever make such illicit relations morally positive or pleasing to God. Now let's face it. Laura's mother, Laura Vicuña's mother, Mercedes, found herself in a very difficult spot. A desperate widow with two small, needy children who surrenders to the lusts of another in order to survive to have her children cared for. But Laura's offering of herself, of her very life as a victim soul, show that this good daughter and the blessed Lord did not want this behavior to continue. The bishop's letter then adds that the practice of forbidding confession and Holy Communion to those in active, adulterous unions is not so much a judgment upon the internal state of their human souls, for the church possesses no infallible gift to discern the internal life. Subjective state of grace, the believer, we don't know. But rather, Holy Church and her ministers are judging the visible, public, and objective nature of the situation as one being adultery. And such a situation can only be cured by a separation of the two, or at least a firm, truly firm resolve and purpose to live in total continence as would a brother and sister. If adulterous couples were to be admitted to Holy Communion, if Mercedes and Signor Mora had been falsely accompanied and encouraged by local pastor to approach the altar rail after a time of discernment but not conversion the faithful around them would have been led into error regarding the teachings on marriage, including its indissolubility. Blessed Laura Vicuña offered her life for the soul of her beloved mother. She did not compromise the Holy Gospel. She noted that her mother could not receive Holy Communion, for she was not right with the good Lord and needed to be healed. And Laura would be God's instrument in bringing about a true conversion, and yes, perhaps the very salvation of Mercedes. Finally, when Our Lady came to Fatima, she identified herself mainly, and mainly appeared to the children as Our Lady of the Rosary. The Rosary is that prayer that will help marriage and family. For the family, as we know, that prays the rosary together will stay together. I'm well aware that things look very dark at this particular moment for the world, especially for the future of marriage and family. Things are darkest in nature just before the rising of the sun. Mary is the morning star. She is that planet Venus which announces the dawn of the day of Christ the King. Although there may well be a chastisement put upon mankind, there will also come a restoration period, the triumph of Mary's immaculate heart, and yes, the promise she gave of a certain age of peace for mankind, all guaranteed by Our Lady of Fatima. For Christ will be king in men's hearts and societies, and Mary will be his queen mother. And those subjects most devoted to the Queen of Heaven and Earth and her Rosary will be the special instruments in this time of restoration. And that is why, dear people, the devil fears the Blessed Mother most of all. Satan fears Mary in some way more than he fears God himself. 
Extraordinary thing to say, but it's said by a saint, St. Louis Marie de Montfort. The devil fears Mary more than God. Because if the good Lord were to take on Satan and to crush him, Satan could keep his pride. He could say that, well, I, uh, I fought against God and I lost, but hey, it was God. He crushed me, but then he's my creator. But when the instrument of Satan's demise is a virgin from Nazareth, a human person, his humiliation is complete. It is utterly humiliating for him. And the formula for crushing the head of the serpent, which Our Lady will do, is right before us. The prescription of bringing about a time of restoration and peace, and yes, victory for marriage and family, has been given to us, and it begins with the recitation of the Holy Rosary. That great priest, and yes, teacher of the young, St. John Bosco was also an individual who received many, many visions and dreams from the good Lord. And one particular dream, Don Bosco saw a poisonous serpent, a poisonous serpent that had been let loose and was seeking to bite anyone around it. But all of a sudden, St. John Bosco noted that when the angelic salutation was recited, the Ave Maria, the Hail Mary, that very salutation wrapped itself around the serpent as if it were a chain and bound the serpent up. Well, the Holy Rosary is made up of 150 such angelic salutations, the Hail Marys, and that is why the Hail Mary is a great weapon against our adversary. The Holy Rosary made up of those Hail Marys is a powerful sling with small stones that can knock down the Goliaths of this world. Or as that great Capuchin friar, Padre Pio, once stated, the Holy Rosary is a weapon. And when Padre Pio misplaced his rosary, or it was stolen off of him from some relic seeker, Padre Pio would always say, where is my weapon? To show the power of the rosary, consider its origins. In the year 1214, while prayerfully pleading before a statue of our Blessed Mother in southern France, St. Dominic received the rosary directly from the hands of the Blessed Mother. And why did our Blessed Mother give Dominic the rosary? In order to restrain the enemy. And in this case, it was the decisive battle being fought over marriage again. In this case, the enemy was the heresy of Albigensianism, one of the most unchristian, inhuman, and anti-marriage and anti-family belief systems ever seen on earth. Albigensianism was nothing short of a culture of death present in the Middle Ages, the 13th century. Albigensianism condemned anything that was bodily or material. For these heretics, anything that was material was from the devil, and so they wanted fewer and fewer bodies around. Therefore, they promoted suicide, one less body. They promoted also euthanasia, mercy killing, because that would release the elderly and the infirm from their bodies. Again, less bodies. And yes, they strongly condemned marriage because that would mean more bodies coming forth and the growth of the family. They promoted instead a contraceptive mentality and much sodomitical behavior. For them, relations were purely recreational and never about bringing forth life. Now today, such perversions would find constitutional protection because it is the new normal. But back then, the hierarchy of the church was absolutely concerned, even obsessed with marriage and life issues. And what would be the answer to such evil? What would be the solution to a spiritual desert and a culture of death and infertility? The rosary is the answer for the family. Rosary comes from that Latin word ros, R-O-S, which simply means do. And like the heavenly dew coming down upon the spiritual desert of the world, it brings new life through spiritual moisture. 
Each bead is like a raindrop, a spiritual raindrop upon the desert of this world. And the key was to rain down the rain of grace in a prayer that was both spiritual and material. That's what makes the rosary so special. It is a prayer for men because it is a prayer that is for the body and the soul, for the whole of man. Our Lady said to St. Dominic when she gave him the rosary directly, Our Lady said to St. Dominic, quote, If you want conversions, then preach my Psalter, preach my rosary made up of 150 Hail Marys and 15 Our Fathers. Because the Holy Rosary, dear people, is that loving thread of mercy by which we hang in there persevering to the end. The Holy Rosary is the perfect prayer again for human beings with bodies and souls because it activates every part of man. The Holy Rosary activates the mind for meditation, pondering the mysteries of our Lord's life and our Lady's wondrous mysteries as well. It also activates the tongue, the lips of man. It is a vocal prayer that is spoken and it is heard by the ears. And yet it's even a tangible prayer. You can literally touch it and feel it so that even little children who may not know how to speak as yet can at least hold a blessed rosary and gain the benefits of this powerful prayer. Therefore, the Holy Rosary is incarnational. It is Christian a heavenly prayer that touches both body and soul, and it is one of the most important sacramentals that we have. How many tens and tens and tens of encyclicals popes have written on the Holy Rosary? But it only works if it's on your person and is prayed. For some, the Rosary will be that saving rope that will help us climb the mountain of God and to reach the new Jerusalem. It is also a lifeline for a fallen sinner, but for others, especially the devil and his crew, the rosary will be that scourge that beats down the foe and a chain that restrains the adversary and a noose that will hang the enemies that we have. The holy rosary, therefore, dear people, has great power. Power to restrain evil, Power to lift up the fallen, power to bind the serpent. And I guarantee you here and now this evening that if you and your families pray the rosary every day, you will be lifted up to heaven one day. If all Christian people in this country would pray the Holy Rosary daily, there would be peace. Russia would be consecrated, and it would be converted to the Catholic faith. The devil and his offspring and their ungodly agenda would be defeated. And the rosary, as history tells us over and over again, would defeat a lot more Muslims than drone strikes. That heavenly dew of divine grace would saturate the very soil of this nation and the Western world until a new Christendom would emerge with all things restored by Christ the King. Marriage and family would be healed and restored. That is the power of the Holy Rosary. Don't let the only time you hold the rosary be when you're in your coffin at death. It is the key ingredient and a formula for peace and restoration. As one pope said in the past, the only bad rosary was the one that was not said or prayed. Pray the rosary of Mary the Queen, and Christ will always be your king. God bless you, and may you keep this parish mission and the rosary alive in your minds and hearts. Viva Christore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This past Friday was the feast of Our Lady of Czestochowa. She was named by King Casimir of Poland in 1656 as the Queen of Poland, 
and Pope Pius XI gave her a feast day under the same title. My material for this portion of the sermon here comes mostly from Joan Carol Cruz and her book, uh, Miraculous Images of Our Lady. Tradition tells us that the image of Our Lady of Czestochowa was actually painted by St. Luke the Apostle. This feast day gives us a chance to tie several things together. So there are actually kind of three parts to this sermon. After the painting was created by St. Luke, it remained in Jerusalem until it was found by St. Helen around the year 326, when she was there in her search for the true cross. She brought the painting to Constantinople, where her son, the Emperor Constantine, built a special church to house it. On one occasion, centuries later, the image alone defended the city from the Saracens. When the Muslims were in position to attack Constantinople, the image was taken in procession around the walls of the city. And with that, and only that, the Muslims fled. The image remained in Constantinople until almost the year 1000, when it found its way to Russia, the part of Russia which later became Poland. While it was there, the city came under attack, and the painting was struck by an enemy's arrow. There's a scar below the scars on the cheek that we're all familiar with, the two, scar, the two long scars, which we'll talk about in a moment. There's another scar lower down on her neck. And despite efforts to repair these, these scars, they have remained. Well, seeing in this event that the image of Mary was in danger where it was, St. Ladislaw decided that he should move it to a safer location in another city. On the way, the painting had to pass through the town of Czestochowa. There, the wagon carrying it stopped for the night, and the picture was placed for the night in the Church of the Assumption on the hill of Jasnagora. On the morning of August 26, 1382, when the time came for St. Ladislaw and the image to continue their journey, the horses who had been hitched to the wagon refused to move. St. Ladislaw saw right away in this the hand of God, for the horses had behaved just fine up to that point in the trip, and it was not a natural thing for them to behave this way. So the saint ordered that the image be replaced in the church at Jasnagora and remain there, and that a monastery be founded there for monks to protect and honor the image. So the Pauline fathers have guarded the image of the mon in the monastery at Jasnagora for over 600 years now. But there have been many trials and tests and many miracles in that time. In 1430, a band of heretics was pillaging the monastery. They loaded the image onto a cart to haul it away. But again, the horses would not move. In different horses this time, it was 50 years later. So the Hussite heretics smashed the picture. One of the soldiers drew his sword and began hacking at the pieces. But before his third stroke could fall, he himself was struck to the ground with a pain that very soon took his life. The two slash marks we see on Our Lady's cheek in the image are from this event. In 1655, a Protestant army of 12,000 men came against the monastery, which was manned with only 300 monks and some guards. The Protestants were totally and disgracefully defeated. Odds of 40 to 1 are nothing for the Mother of God. A year later when King, is when King Casimir named Our Lady of Czestochowa as the Queen of Poland. In 1920, the Russian armies approached the city of Warsaw on the Feast of Our Lady of Snows. The people of Poland, of course, fled to Mary for protection. Her image appeared in the sky over the city of Warsaw, and the Russians, like the Saracens centuries earlier, withdrew without even attacking. The people of Poland are still very dedicated, of course, to Our Lady of Czestochowa and are rightly blessed and rewarded for their devotion. 
So there's just a little bit about that famous image that we've all seen. Her feast day was just this past Friday, the anniversary of that first time that the horses wouldn't move, and Mary decided that she wanted to stay in Chestahova. How good it is to be Catholic. We know that we can rely on the intercession and the protection of the saints. And more than this, we even have sacred images and sacramentals with which to implore and draw down grace from God. Really quickly, to remember what sacramentals are. Sacraments, we know, are outward signs instituted by Christ to give grace. We better know that. There are three elements to that definition. Outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. A sacramental is an outward sign instituted by the church to give grace. Things like medals, blessings, holy cards, images, holy water. Sacramentals have power. As our Lord today used spit to cure the man. If faith were all that was necessary, why would our Lord use things like spit, on other occasions mud? The material world is there to help us get to heaven. And through the power of the church, we can sanctify these material things as aids to bringing us grace and protection of Almighty God. That's how the universe works. Now, just to be clear again, against our Protestant brethren, we do not worship images any more than we worship saints. We ask the saints for their intercession in prayer, asking them to get help for us from God. We understand that it's all God's power, and we honor the images as representing those saints, not for the sake of honoring the image itself, The honor given to the image is the honor given to the saint. Just as when one honors the flag of his country, he is not honoring a piece of colored cloth, but he's honoring the country for which it stands. And turning from that then back to the Blessed Mother, in honor of this recent feast of hers, I thought I would take a moment to discuss perhaps the most powerful sacramental in the church her Holy Rosary. Now here again we will take some flack from our separated brethren. For Matthew 6, 7 tells us, When you are praying, speak not much as the heathens do, for they think that in their much speaking they may be heard. Our Protestant friends, of course, think that we are violating this scripture passage when we repeat the Hail Mary over and over and over again in the Rosary. But this is not true. We understand that by simply repeating words, even words like this in the rosary, we will not get what we're praying for. But we use the words of the rosary to honor Mary and her son, and they also help us focus our prayers and to pray with more devotion. It is not the words themselves that bring the blessing, but the devotion and the faith attached to those words. Faith without works is dead, so it's just fine to use these formulated prayers. St. Padre Pio used to refer to his rosary beads as his weapon. Indeed, it is a powerful thing. It takes more power, for instance, to move a soul from the state of mortal sin to the state of grace than it took to create the entire universe. And yet, St. Louis de Montfort shows us over and over again that, quote, great sinners, both men and women, have been converted after 20, 30, 40 years of sin and unspeakable vice because they persevered in saying the Holy Rosary. Many of my comments that follow are taken from St. Louis de Montfort, but be clear, God gives us so many very simple ways to ensure our salvation. Something so simple as being devoted to the rosary, 
no matter what our problems, no matter how confusing or difficult things seem, if we devote ourselves to the rosary, Mary will take care of the rest. St. Louis de Montfort goes on to assure us that, quote, if you practice this devotion and help to spread it, you will learn more from the rosary than from any spiritual book and have the happiness of being rewarded by Our Lady according to the promises she made to St. Dominic. Mary promised her special protection and very great graces to those who say the rosary. The rosary, Mary said, shall be a very powerful armor against hell. It shall destroy vice, deliver from sin, and shall dispel heresy. It shall obtain for souls the most abundant divine mercies. Think how simple this is. What a great blessing to be raised with a daily rosary. Those who will recite my rosary piously, considering its mysteries, shall not be overwhelmed by misfortune, nor die a bad death. The sinner shall be converted, and the just shall grow in grace and become worthy of eternal life. Those who will recite my rosary, Mary said, shall find during their life and at their death the light of God the fullness of his grace, and shall share in the merits of the blessed. It's a guarantee of heaven. The true children of my rosary, Mary said, shall enjoy great glory in heaven. What you ask through my rosary, she said, you shall obtain. Devotion to my rosary is a special sign of predestination. The rosary teaches us the virtues of our Lord and his Holy Mother, and leads us in mental prayer, says St. Louis de Montfort. Blessed Alain de la Roche tells us this about the power of the rosary. He says, By it, sinners are forgiven, thirsty souls are refreshed, those who are chained have their bonds broken, the sad find happiness, those who are tempted find peace, the poor find help, pride is overcome, and the suffering in, pur in purgatory have their pains eased. What a powerful, powerful tool. Heaven is yours, guaranteed, if you will take this devotion seriously. So how do we take the rosary seriously? How do you say the rosary such that your salvation is guaranteed? Well, for one thing, we have to understand this power. St. Louis de Montfort tells us, that it is not so much the length of the prayer, but the devotion or the attention with which one says the prayer. One Hail Mary said well is worth more than 15 decades said badly. Two things to make sure that we're saying the rosary well. It's very simple. A purpose of amendment and pay attention. Remember, it's not so much the words, but the devotion that makes it a good prayer. Two things, purpose of amendment and pay attention. So the purpose of amendment. See, grace builds on nature. You can't expect saying the rosary to solve all your problems if you will not take the steps to solve your problems. Remember the old expression, right? Work as if everything depends on you, but pray as if everything depends on God. See, the guy who prays his rosary every day saying, I wish I could get over this drinking problem, but he won't quit hanging out in bars, he is not really serious about quitting. How is Mary going to help him if he won't give her the opportunity? Now, if he's trying to avoid those places, well, that's different. Mary certainly will help him. So we have to do our part. If we do, when we say the rosary, then we cannot fail. Thus, even sinners, and indeed especially sinners, can say the rosary most profitably. No matter what the sin, no matter how long it has gone on, no matter how deep it goes or how far from God, if one will have a purpose of amendment, the desire and intention to sin no more, the rosary will save him. And the second thing we need to do to make sure that we're saying a rosary well is to pay attention, to say the prayers as they were meant to be said. Pay attention. That's why those prayers are there. That's why we name the mysteries. 
so that we can have something to pay attention to. That's how we're supposed to use these prayers. What, for example, would become of the greatest knight in the world if he took the best sword that was ever made into battle, but he kept it in its scabbard and held it by the wrong end and used it as a club? Wouldn't be very useful, would it? So we need to pay attention during the rosary. That's how to use these prayers. Here's an example. We'll go through this right now. You can use your imagination. You can shut your eyes if you want and think about this. Imagine your favorite car or what's hanging in your closet or the dinner you're looking forward to tonight. See, this is the power of the imagination. You can make these things really present. Now change that image to the angel Gabriel standing before the Blessed Mother. You can picture it, can't you? Because you chose to. That's the gift of the imagination. It's not just there to be a nuisance when you're trying to do something serious. You're in control of this gift. See, each time I said something, you had a different image in your mind. It's why God gave us an imagination. We need to use it. Of course, it can be a lot of fun. And certainly, if we use it in prayer, it can be very pleasing, very peaceful. Meditating on the prayers we're saying. Place yourself at the time and the place of the mystery you are praying. Bethlehem. You know what it is to be cold. You know what the night looks like. A few of you probably even know what snow looks like. We're Calvary. We know dust, humidity, blood, sweat. We can think about these things. Pentecost, there's a lot to use your imagination on, or the assumption. And we say the words of the Annunciation 53 times in the Hail Marys of each rosary. Think of that particular event, the greatest event in human history. And think about why those things are going on, what God has done for us. And the two and a half minutes that it takes you to say one decade is not nearly enough, no matter how fast your mind works. This is what it means to meditate on the rosary. It's very, very simple. We've all done it. Some of you are doing it just now. See, God wants all men to be saved, but no man is saved without prayer. Therefore, it must be possible for all men to pray. And this is what it means to pray the rosary. Have a purpose of amendment. Pay attention and simply say a rosary each day. And we cannot fail. Our salvation is guaranteed because we are in the protection of the Blessed Virgin Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We'll take our reading from the second book of Maccabees. It is a good and holy thing to pray for the dead, that they might be loosed from their sins. Again, words taken from the second book of Maccabees. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. As Sister Marie Bernard lay dying on her bed in the infirmary of her convent at Nevers, France, one of the sisters asked her the following question. Why don't you ask Our Lady of Lords to cure you completely? I mean, through the intercession of Mary, numerous pilgrims had received miraculous healings of body, so why not you, the very visionary of Lords who saw the Blessed Mother? But Bernadette responded, it's no use. Our Lady told me that I shall die young. Her early 
and even painful death was actually predicted by the Blessed Mother when she gave the visionary that daunting message. Bernadette, she said, I cannot promise to make you happy in this life, but only in the next. So with this knowledge, with this knowledge of a life of suffering on earth, as well as a very early death, Bernadette was able to detach herself from the things of the world and to hope for the best things in the life to come. At 3 p.m., the hour of the passion and death of our Lord, a bell rang in the convent calling all the sisters to the side of Bernadette. The priest had already administered the extreme unction, the final anointing, and he'd already recited the prayers for the dying. Some of the sisters who were nurses began to sprinkle holy water on Bernadette because she was being tempted by the devil to despair. Bernadette began to groan out in an agonizing voice, my God, my God. And she held a crucifix close to her breast. But then she stretched out her arms as if she were on a cross of pain, and she cried out, I thirst. One of the sisters then began to recite the Hail Mary, and Bernadette joined in with great fervor at those words, Holy Mary, Mother of God. Her final words on earth were, Pray for me. Pray for me, a poor sinner. A poor sinner. With these final words upon her lips, Bernadette expired, still clutching that crucifix and shedding two final tears which rolled down her cheeks. The infirmarian then closed Bernadette's eyes. It was 3.15 in the afternoon, the hour of mercy, April 16, 1879. The visionary of Lourdes, the one who saw our Blessed Mother, would die at the age of 35 years old. You know, it was my great privilege in the past to serve as a chaplain for a group of cloistered poor Clare nuns at Our Lady of the Angels Monastery in Hansville, Alabama, at this beautiful convent founded by Mother Mary Angelica. A similar episode to that of Bernadette occurred. A religious daughter of Mother Angelica, a sister Immaculata, had been diagnosed with terminal cancer in the stomach. She was only in her 40s. Sister Immaculata once said to me that she often complained when she was younger about the least discomfort in her life. Even if it were a pebble in her shoe, she would complain. But now she felt as if the sharpest rocks were cutting and wounding her stomach continuously. The brutal rounds of chemotherapy devastated her small frame. Her favorite dessert was blueberry pie. And such a treat was prepared for her just a few weeks before her death. Though she had little or no appetite, Sister Immaculata asked for the smallest of slices, but her sense of taste was gone due to the chemo. It brought her no delight. It is said that those who endure such cancer treatments and survive will still have a metallic, even poisonous taste memory of the chemo years afterwards. Father Joseph Mary Wolf, that good Franciscan friar, would offer a special mass of the viaticum the day before the death, where the dying sister would confess her sins for a final time, would receive the anointing, and also that divine food for the journey home, again known as the viaticum. As Sister Immaculata lay dying during the night, all the nuns were gathered around her in prayer. And it just so happened that the foot of her bed was facing towards the east. And so when one of the nuns opened the window blinds and revealed the night sky, there was included the planet Venus, the morning star, 
the symbol of Our Lady in the East. And although she could hardly move for days, Sister Immaculata physically rose up in bed with great energy. And she reached towards that window as if to grab the hand of the risen Christ and perhaps the mantle of Our Lady. But then she fell back again and began the death rattle, the final labored breaths. This consecrated virgin with her lamp alight was ready to meet the bridegroom and his mother. Before the sun rose, I began to hear the peal of bells issuing forth from the monastery bell tower. I knew that Sister Maculata had passed from this world. You know, I'm reminded of what the heretic, the arch-heretic known as Melanchthon, once wrote. Melanchthon was a follower of that infamous person known as Martin Luther. Melanchthon had received a letter from his dying Catholic mother. And the letter posed the following question, namely, should she remain a Catholic or become a Lutheran as death approached? Her son Melanchthon responded, Mother, it is difficult to live as a Roman Catholic, but it is better to die as a Roman Catholic. How true, how very, very true. A requiem or funeral mass would soon be offered for the soul, for the repose of the soul of Sister Immaculata. I attended the mass and heard the beautiful chanting of the nuns, including that haunting antiphon, Requiem Eternum, eternal rest grant unto her, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon her. After the Holy Mass, the body of Immaculata was brought to the burial vault located in the crypt church beneath the monastery. Her body would be buried right next to a sister, David, who happened to be the biological mother of Mother Mary Angelica of the Annunciation. You know, at every Mass, without exception, every single holy sacrifice of the Mass, we pray for the dead. During the memento for the dead, the priest whispers those awesome words from the Roman canon. Remember those who have died and have gone before us with the sign of faith and sleep the repose of peace, that they may find a place of rest, a place of light, a place of peace. This rest is not to be viewed as being a leisurely waste of time or sleeping in late on a cold winter morning, but rather a final rest a being at peace, being in the right place forever, in the presence of the most blessed Trinity. On the other hand, those in hell are never at peace, but forever restless, for they are in the wrong place. Place without hope, place filled with utter despair, as they endure a continuing punishment that will never cease nor lessen in intensity. Now, the fact that we pray for the dead at every Mass throughout the whole world every day means that we're praying for the dead every day, even every hour, even every minute, even every second in the church. And this demonstrates our belief in the doctrine of purgatory. This, in fact, is the best proof for what is an infallible dogma that may not be denied, the dogma of purgatory. You don't pray for the saints in heaven. That would be silly. They don't need our prayers, for they are at rest and peace. We pray to the saints. We don't pray for them. And as for the souls in hell, our prayers would be absolutely useless, for they cannot be helped in any way. We believe that eternal life once possessed can never be taken away. And those who experience eternal death, that can never be reversed. And so if the Jews, 
and all true Christians have always prayed for the dead, who are they praying for? If not for the souls present in purgatory, who are members of what we call the church suffering. Now, there's a Latin phrase that I would like you to remember. A Latin phrase that all Catholics should be familiar with. And that Latin phrase is lex orandi, lex credendi. That is the lex orandi, the law of praying, is the lex credendi, the law of believing. Simply put, how we pray shows how we believe. Our prayers for the dead demonstrate our belief in purgatory. If you pray for the dead, then there must be a belief that there's a place where souls can benefit from these prayers. Yet despite all the prayers at Mass for the dead, the existence of purgatory has often been denied, ignored, or just completely forgotten in this modern age. And that is understandable considering the state of the modern world. Remember what Pope Pius XII of Holy Memory once said. He said, the problem with the 20th century is that man has a loss of the sense of sin. The Pope wasn't lamenting that men sinned. Men have sinned since the fall of Adam. He was sorrowful and lamenting that men had denied that sin even existed. Well, if you deny that there is such a thing as sin, then the notion of doing penance or making satisfaction for sin on earth or in purgatory is, of course, going to be rejected. No sin, why would they be a purgatory? A little more than 10 years ago, my grandmother on my mother's side, experienced a serious downturn in her bodily health. Like many her age, she suffered from congestive heart failure, which forced her to seek emergency medical attention nearly 20 times in the last year of her life. I went to visit her at the assisted living facility where she lived. Before providing her the sacraments, I reminded her of the phrase that she often used when I complained about things when I was just a kid. She was Irish. She would say, offer it up. In other words, offer up your sufferings. Take up your cross and carry it after Christ. Use your sufferings that are sent your way as a means of making atonement for one's sins in Christ. I was suggesting, in other words, that she try to do her purgatory on earth. When our prayers, our works, and acceptings of sufferings can still be a benefit to us. But my grandmother was unsure, she told me. Since she had not heard a sermon on purgatory coming forth from the pulpit of her parish in the 50 preceding years. She had never heard a sermon on purgatory, even at a funeral. My grandmother had gone to Catholic schools. She went K through 12. The good nuns taught her that doctrine, no doubt. And she had probably attended, being that it was a Catholic school, many requiem masses for the dead, complete with black vestments, unbleached candles, and the dies irae being sung by the choir. But in her adult years, many of those liturgical symbols and practices had been dismissed, ignored, or forgotten. Now, the lay folk today who attend funerals still wear black or gray or other dark colors. But now, in many cases, the priests wear white. Requiem masses have been replaced by what they call masses of the resurrection which is strange considering that there's a corpse in the church. And then there is the canonization sermons that happen, the glowing eulogies which assure us that the deceased is definitely fully enjoying himself above, perhaps on the back nine. 
And that he's definitely in heaven and he doesn't need masses. He doesn't need our prayers. In fact, many of the funeral programs, the funeral programs which list the pallbearers and the songs and readings for the mass, many funeral programs that I have read show a picture of the deceased on the front cover along with their natural date of birth, followed by the date of their death and entrance into the eternal glory of heaven. It's almost like I got a holy card in my hand. Again, remember the Latin phrase I used previously, lex orandi, lex credendi. How we pray, how we practice our devotional life shows what we believe Our modern liturgical practices and customs, by and large, betray a lack of belief in purgatory. We don't pray for the dead like we used to. And souls in purgatory are suffering longer because of that. To my right, right next to the pulpit here, I have an old statue. I think it's about 85 years old. It was from a convent. It was been repainted recently. An old statue of the Lady of Lords, complete with her white dress, her blue sash around her middle with golden roses upon her feet. But there is also another clue that this is a statue of Our Lady of Lords, and that is the rosary she holds upon her arm. You see, a real good statue of Lords always shows a six-decade rosary. Five decades, of course, to recount the five mysteries, but also an additional decade to be prayed for the holy and poor souls in purgatory, which has been a pious devotion at Lourdes almost since the time of the apparition itself. In fact, when Bernadette had her first apparition of the Blessed Mother, On February 11th, 1858, some people thought that it must be a soul from the other world begging for prayers and for masses. Now, last night I spoke about the resurrection of the dead, as well as touching upon the last things, the four last things, namely death, judgment, heaven, and hell. This is a parish mission. We talk about our end and how to get there. But notice, death, judgment, heaven, hell, the last things, purgatory is not listed. Purgatory is not listed among those items because purgatory is not final. It's not a last thing, but it's a passing reality. It's a temporary place of purification for those who are saved. They're assured of eternal rest in heaven above. The persons in this divine prison are holy souls because they died in a state of grace, but they are still in need of further healing of smaller or what we call venial sins, but also healing from damages that were caused by forgiven mortal sins. Sins have costs, by the way. The catechism Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches us the following, quote, All who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured their eternal salvation. But after death, the catechism continues, they undergo a purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. The Catechism concludes, the Church calls this place purgatory. Now, in a more simple way, for those who depart this life not yet good enough for heaven, but certainly not bad enough for hell, there is a place where any leftover problems are purged and souls are cleansed. Therefore, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, which is only the Catholic Church, has three sections, three provinces. Certainly the church triumphant above, where the saints are at rest and they rejoice and they triumph in Christ's victory in them. And then also the church militant, 
That's us on earth who have to be militant because we are working and fighting for our very salvation. But there's also a third province, if you will, of the kingdom of God, and that is the church suffering. As regards purgatory's location, let's look at what the saints say. They tell the truth. Purgatory's location, according to the saints, is, well, it's near hell. It's near the very center of this earth. The fires of hell and the fires of purgatory, therefore, are the exact same fires in terms of pain. St. Augustine, the great church father who I've mentioned quite often, St. Augustine teaches the same fire that burns the lost in hell is the same fire that burns the saved. The only difference is duration, length of time. Hell fires go on forever and ever. But the fires in purgatory are temporary. Now, to begin this conference, I've read a passage from the second book, Maccabees. It is a good and holy thing to pray for the dead, that they might be loosed from their sins. From the Holy Bible, therefore, we learn that Jews, ancient Jews, always prayed for those who had died. Those who had died even with sin, obvious sin, and the remains of sin still on their souls. Consider, too, what our Lord said in the New Testament, in the very Gospels. In the Holy Gospel of St. Matthew, Jesus says, Whoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, who blasphemes, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world nor in the next world. Interesting addition there by our Lord. Now, such a statement from the Son of God suggests that some sins can be forgiven in the world to come. Pope St. Gregory the Great, another father of the church, doctor of the church, St. Gregory the Great, along with so many others, taught the following. He said, as for lesser faults, we must believe, note the adverb, we must believe that before the final judgment, there is a place with a purifying fire. He who is truth, Gregory continues, says that whoever utters blasphemy against the Holy Ghost will not be pardoned either in this age or in the next. Well, from this we understand that certain offenses can be forgiven in this age, but certain others in the age to come. Again, souls in heaven don't need purification, and souls in hell are forever impure. So for praying for the dead that they might be purified, there must be a place of purification. Now, a few years back, I visited a homeschooling family, a homeschooling family that lived on a nice farm in Missouri. And on their farm, they actually had a chapel. What a blessing. The chapel had a beautiful set of statues. It had even pews and it had a beautiful altar. But what struck me especially was the image just above the altar in that chapel. It showed a priest in black vestments offering a requiem mass. But it also showed just below the altar souls. Souls in purgatory and the fires of the purgatory looking upwards, looking for assistance from the mass being offered. There were the other images of angels who were at the Mass, catching the blood of Christ in chalices and bringing it down to the souls in purgatory to relieve them of their pain and to even release some and to bring them to heaven through the offering of the Mass, the representation of the sacrifice of Calvary done in an unbloody manner. All these things I've given you to prove about purgatory, scripture, sacred tradition, the fathers of the church, the catechism, even artwork. In the end, it's just about common sense. You see, only the pure can go to heaven. The purest of the pure. 
What does our Lord say? Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. The book of Revelations, St. John's Apocalypse, clearly says that nothing unclean, nothing undefiled can enter through the pearly gates. Not even a little gossip, not even little white lies, not allowed. In short, only pure, unblemished souls, only angels and saints can breathe that pure celestial air in heaven above. And so if one does reject purgatory, which many quote-unquote Christians do, then anyone with even the slightest stain even the smallest attachment to created things, even with only venial sin on their soul, would end up in hell. That sounds unmerciful to me. Hence, there must be a place of temporary imprisonment where souls who die in a state of grace, souls who are saved in union with God, but they go to be purified of any of their worldliness which still clings to their souls. They were good soldiers. They fought the fight, but they were wounded in battle. A final proof for this church teaching is far more extraordinary, namely the fact that holy and poor souls from purgatory have literally visited this earthly realm. They have made contact and they had even left their mark saying they were here. In Rome, if you get a chance to go there, it's a wondrous place of pilgrimage. In Rome, along the Tiber River, you will find the Church of the Sacred Heart, which also houses the Museum of the Holy and Poor Souls. The Church itself of the Sacred Heart has a brilliant Gothic style. But over the entryway, you will also see an image, a marble sculpture of souls in purgatory looking upwards for release and for relief. But inside the actual museum, you will see different display cases that hold different items. Holy Bibles, prayer books, table tops, articles of clothing but they all bear the singed marks or burn marks of the hands of souls in purgatory. These souls were permitted by God to return to earth to ask and beg family members for prayers and for masses. In one exhibit, one can see the burn mark left by a deceased mother upon the sleeve of her son when she appeared to him one night. Her son told church investigators that for 11 consecutive nights, he heard frightening and strange noises in the house. On the 12th night, his mother appeared to him to remind him of his duty, which he had failed to complete, according to her last will and testament. She had asked that prayers be offered for the repose of her soul, according to her will. He never fulfilled that particular request. Not only did she reproach him for that problem, but also reproached him for his own immorality and told him to change his behavior and to start practicing the Catholic faith again. But before she disappeared, in order to emphasize her requests, she placed her hand upon the sleeve of his nightshirt, leaving a clear, singed impression. Her son needless to say, was quickly converted and later found his own pious religious community. When I was younger, much younger, I remembered a television commercial for a product on the market known as Fram Oil Filters. The commercial showed a garage mechanic with a car next to him that needed a very serious and expensive repair due to the fact that the owner had failed to change his oil filter regularly. The mechanic also held up a $5 Fram oil filter in his hand. And looking directly into the camera, he said, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. 
In other words, avoid the consequences of a big payment later by taking care of things now. And this basic truth regarding car maintenance is also true in regards to our moral behavior. You see, sin costs. It's very costly. Not only to our blessed Lord, who shows the effects of sin in the flesh, but it affects us. It even affects the universe. It makes us dysfunctional within. Vices begin to grow. But then we cause objectively damage throughout the whole church by our sins. We're all an assembly of one people. My problems, my disease spiritually could be passed on and hurt others. Sin has costs. Now certainly, our dearest Lord, infinite in mercy, forgives the guilt of our sins when we turn to him humbly and with contrite hearts especially in the confessional. But his forgiveness, important point, his forgiveness does not mean that the good Lord will not demand reparation. Whenever our Lord forgives, he also gives penances. That's how it works. Whenever he forgives our guilt, he says, oh, by the way, satisfaction, payback. Consider, for example, the story of Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden famous story. They commit the original sin, a horrible act of rebellion and disobedience, and Almighty God forgives them. He forgives them right away. But then he turns to Adam and says, oh, by the way, all those things in nature, including the fields that you were to till this garden, they're going to start rebelling against you. You'll have weeds and thistles, which will make your labor very laborious. Then God turns to Eve and says, I would have made your childbearing and child delivery without pain. But now there's going to be labor pains. Then he turns to both of them and to all the children that will come forth from Adam and Eve. And he says, you will die. That gift of immortality I gave you and gifts aren't owed is now going to be taken back. You are dust, and unto dust you definitely shall return. God forgives, but there's consequences to our sins. Furthermore, think about this. This is the perfect example. From sacred scripture, the Old Testament, consider the story of Holy Moses. Holy Moses is an image of Christ. It's basically a prefigurement of Christ. He's the greatest prophet there is. It's Holy Moses. And you know what happened? Moses did not witness well to the Israelites regarding God's holiness and goodness. He became bitter, the Bible tells us. And so what happened? God said, I will forgive you, Moses, but you will not be able to enter the Holy Land. And so Moses, as you know, before he died, went up to a place called Mount Nebo, and he looked on the horizon, and he saw the Holy Land only from a distance, but could not enter in. Holy Moses! What a perfect image of a holy soul. But they aren't able to get to the holy land of heaven just yet. Think about King David, who had a heart after the heart of God. But King David was a sinner, major sinner, murderer, And the reason he murdered someone named Uriah is because he had committed adultery with Uriah's wife called Bathsheba. And he also took a census seeking to count God's holy people, which was against the laws of Almighty God. God forgave him all those sins. But there was still some satisfaction to make. So what happened? The baby that was conceived by Bathsheba was to die. And also because he did that census, a plague came upon all of Israel. Consequences are still there. In other words, the good Lord may wipe away punishment and eternal hellfire in an instant. But that does not mean he erases all the painful consequences due to sin. 
This is why the church, which is the mystical body of Christ, has what is called a penitential system. We have a whole penitential system. We have, for example, the sacrament of penance, the confessional. The priest, by the power of Christ, the power of the Holy Ghost, Christ is the ultimate minister, will forgive our sins. But then the priest says, oh, by the way, that'll be two decades of the rosary. Immediately a penance is given. And then think of the season coming up, the Lenten season, the Advent season. In the old calendar, we have what what are called the ember days, which happen four times in the year. These are penitential times in which we have an opportunity to start to make atonement for our sins in Christ. We also have plenary and partial indulgences, which is also part of the penitential system. This reminds Catholics that God does always remove, certainly, eternal hellfire if we confess our mortal sins. That's true. But it doesn't always remove the whole punishment due to the sins altogether. The classic example is from your catechisms in the old days. Little Tommy, who plays baseball near the family house, he's been told a hundred times, don't play baseball near the house. He plays baseball, hits it with the bat, ends up through the bay window. Mom and dad forgive Tommy for what he's done. But then there's the question of the window. And because they're good parents, and God is the best parent, they will know that there are some consequences resulting from bad action. In a real way, then, purgatory is, and we should not be afraid to use this, it is a temporary prison. In the Gospels, our Lord says as much. Our Lord says the following, quote, Settle with your opponents. Settle your debts. Settle your accounts now. Because if not, he continues, you will be handed over to the judge who will throw you into prison. And I warn you, you will not be released until you have paid the last penny. Quotation, Jesus Christ. Again, it's just common sense. In a courtroom, a defendant pleads guilty and he receives a sentence. The judge at times may show mercy, but there is still a demand that there be a payment to society. When we seek forgiveness for mortal sin in the confessional, for example, the eternal guilt is taken away. The penitent will not have to face eternal hellfire. But if the debt of punishment is not fully atoned for with great sorrow and acts of penance, it will have to be taken care of in the world to come. Again, the consequences, the consequences of mortal and even venial sin, the damages they have caused need to be repaired with at least temporary punishments. Let me give you an example. When I receive confession, and priests, we go to confession too. In fact, priests and religious should go to confession at least once every two weeks. It's mandated. And so when I go to confession, I go all the time. But I think that it would be easier for me if the next time I went to confession, I actually brought a tape player with me with a recording of my previous confession the week before. Because the same exact sins that I committed last week are the same exact sins that I committed this week. The problem here is sometimes we're not really as sorry as we think. There might be some contrition, but it's not too deep. Because there's not true amendment in life since I really don't change my ways. How often have we gone to the confessional to confess some sins, and five minutes later on the drive back home, we commit the exact same sin. Purgatory is also about removing those venial sins, those smaller sinful attachments that we're really not as sorry for. Now, I want to correct any sort of misperception I don't want to make God into some sort of vengeful, tyrannical being who delights in scourging his creatures. Though truly, 
being a holding cell, I don't want to portray the good Lord as an evil warden who likes to inflict pain upon inmates. After this earthly valley of tears, after this time of crosses and trials, God the Father doesn't want us to experience any more pain. A father who might send his child to the bedroom for a time out, he doesn't enjoy the fact that his child is away from the family table. He longs for the child to return to the family table. Our Heavenly Father has a plan. He's had a plan since the time that you were in his mind, which was from all eternity. A plan to make us into the full stature of Christ. He wants to transform us into another Christ. Are we not called Christians? Are we not called children of God, adopted children of God in Jesus Christ, who can call God Father, for we truly are his children? Well, that means he wants us to be like Christ and perfect. Be you perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be you merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. He wasn't exaggerating. At baptism, we became godly. We became literally a being filled with participation in the divine nature, filled with grace at baptism. The fires of purgatory may be punishing, but they purify. You punish iron by thrusting it into the fire, taking it out and hammering it into shape. But what a beautiful object is made as a result. In fact, the soul in purgatory wants this painful transformation. If there are people out there who will lift weights and run marathons left and right all over the place, killing themselves bodily just to do, they want to do it. They want to be built up. Well, soul in purgatory wants his soul to be that way. The soul in purgatory desires this because they know they're not ready yet for heaven. Like a bride who has a dirty white dress, she knows she's not ready for the wedding, the wedding feast of heaven, until that garment has been cleansed. But the good Lord would much rather have us receive this transformation into a saint while living on earth. Now, many of us have probably stated, in fact, there was a pope one time who stated this. I think it was Pius IX. Once said, if I can just make it to purgatory. If I can just make it to purgatory. But we should not accept that. Our purpose is not to make shortcuts in life. Our purpose is not to sneak into heaven. Furthermore, what is our purpose? To give glory to God. And heaven will realize that in the end, it's all about God. <laughs> all creation, all of our life, all of heaven, all of it's all about him. We're for him. He made us. We belong to him. But aim high. Aim high. Don't aim towards purgatory. Aim towards heaven. Because when you have a target far away, you better aim a little bit higher or else you might miss the target altogether. Now, many of you might be familiar with a famous author of the 14th century, his name is Dante, Dante Alighieri. He wrote famous works, including works on heaven, a work called Paradiso, a work on hell called Inferno, and a work on purgatory called Purgatorio. Now, the author in this book, Dante, explored these realms of the afterlife and he even interviewed certain people and inhabitants in these places. When Dante approached souls in hell, the damned, they were more than willing to talk. They had wasted their life on earth, and they had all the time in the world to be interviewed. They weren't going anywhere. But when Dante visited purgatory and started doing his interviews, 
No one wanted to grant him an interview. I don't have time. I'm busy. See, in purgatory, they're always thinking about climbing that steep mountain that Dante sort of wrote about. This steep, long, arduous climb to get to heaven above. They wanted no delays in getting there. Their focus was was on God and God purifying them. That's why we should look to the souls in purgatory as our model, as our great example. You see, the church, members of the church suffering, the souls in purgatory are the greatest of contemplatives this side of heaven. They are the greatest mystics there are this side of heaven. They're spiritual giants. Though they don't see the good Lord face to face, they have perfect faith, perfect belief. There is no doubt. There are no difficulties in regards to their faith. And they also have perfect hope. They don't possess God yet. He's still distant from them. But they have perfect hope. No difficulty. No despair at all. And like any real mystic, they long to have their weakened wills and imperfections fixed by the divine physician. They're real examples to us because they hunger for more penance. They want more penance. They know they'll be eventually released. They're the most willing of patients who long to be operated on whatever it takes, doctor, whatever it takes, do it. I'll take whatever medicine you give me. You see, they're literally enduring a passive night of the soul. I know that most of us haven't maybe read St. John of the Cross, but that's the highest state of, of, of sort of union with God just before you get there. The passive night of the soul. St. Teresa of Jesus had a book called The Interior Castle in which there's seven sort of steps to get to the throne room where Christ reigns as king. The souls in purgatory are at that final room in the interior castle just outside the throne room where Christ reigns on the throne. Because they died in the state of sanctifying grace with God's divine life within them, The inhabitants of purgatory are called holy souls. They fought the gallant fight. They fought the gallant fight in the church militant, but they still need time to heal their wounds. And it's a difficult set of wounds. St. Augustine, I mentioned earlier, St. Augustine says, and we should listen to this if we just want to make it to purgatory. St. Augustine says, this fire of purgatory will be more severe than any pain that can be felt, seen, or even imagined in this world. St. Thomas Aquinas, again the greatest of all doctors of the church, St. Thomas Aquinas taught that the pains in purgatory are greater than all the pains of all the martyrs who shed their blood for Christ. A few years ago, I met a Polish priest, a good priest who was working here within the United States. This Polish priest loved our country for its beauty, as well as for the enthusiasm and optimism of its citizenry. But then he added that when death came to him, he was going to have his body sent back to Poland to be buried in the same cemetery where his mom and dad were buried. And I commented on this desire, saying how fitting it was to be buried in one's own native land near one's relatives. But the Polish priest corrected me, saying that his desire was not based upon family connections, but rather based upon the fact that people in Poland would visit his grave and offer prayers for his soul. Whereas in the United States, in some cases, that would not happen at all. Purgatory, though temporary, is still a painful environment. And he didn't want to stay there any longer than he would have to. Some final notes. The great mystic, 
The great mystic and holy woman of the 15th century, a woman named St. Catherine of Genoa, she once said the souls in purgatory are very, very happy, much more happy than we are, because they're almost there. St. Catherine of Genoa says, quote, I believe no happiness can be found worthy to be compared with that of a soul in purgatory, except that of the saints in paradise. Only those in heaven are happier. And day by day, she continues, this happiness grows in them as God flows into these souls more and more, as the obstacle to his entrance is consumed. And what does she call these obstacles? She calls them, quote-unquote, sin's rust. Sin's rust, St. Catherine of Genoa states, is the obstacle, and the fires burns the rusts away, so that more and more the soul opens itself up to the divine inflowing, unquote. But despite this incredible happiness, it is still a painful environment. We not only call them holy souls, dear people, we also call them poor souls. They're poor. They are poverty-stricken. They are totally impoverished because they can't do anything for themselves in regards to being released. The souls in the church suffering are just like that story of the paralytic, the paralyzed man in the gospel. Remember, he was the one on the stretcher. He couldn't move on his own. He needed his friends to carry him. And when he got to the place where Jesus was, they had to bring him up to the roof. And his friends opened the tiles on the roof and then lowered him down. He couldn't do anything on his own. He needed friends to help him every step of the way. And so it is with the soul in purgatory. They are like that paralyzed man. You see, we work out our salvation when we're in the body. We work out our salvation only during the light of day, during our time of life on earth. As soon as we die, no more salvation is worked out. So the souls in purgatory are not growing in grace. They're not growing in charity. They reach that spot at their death. They will never grow in more in charity or more in grace. All they're doing is paying down debt. They can no longer work. So when you can't work, what do you have to do? You've got to beg. And they beg for our assistance. If we, as a church, have something called the preferential option for the poor, which is a good teaching meaning that those who are the poorest of the poor demand our greatest attention of all. Well, what about a soul in purgatory? Talk about total poverty-stricken condition. They're the favorites of Jesus, but they're weighted down by debt and spiritual burdens, and we need to help them with our prayers. They beg for the alms of our prayers every single moment. As a priest, I offer masses for the dead all the time. I offer sometimes what is called a Gregorian set of masses. And this is something, for those who are able, it might be good to put in your will. Or perhaps if you've had a loved one who's passed recently, to offer up what are called Gregorian masses. Gregorian masses are 30 masses in a row for one particular soul who has passed from this world. And if that is done, according to tradition and a pious custom, that person will be released from purgatory. Now, this custom of 30 masses in a row for the soul of a deceased person comes from the life of Pope St. Gregory the Great, probably the greatest pope of all outside of St. Peter. While he was pope, St. Gregory heard that a monk in Rome had admitted to stealing and hoarding gold pieces in his room. Such a serious violation of holy poverty for a monk to steal gold is unheard of. So 
the Pope summoned the monk's abbot to come to his office. And the Pope said that the penalty of solitary confinement was to be given to that monk. And furthermore, the Pope ordered that if that monk did not repent before he died, that he would not be buried in a cemetery, but rather be buried in a garbage dump. Well, the Pope's desired result was achieved. The sinful monk who liked gold repented. The monk then died, but the matter did not. Within a few days, Pope Gregory the Great in his prayers realized that he had to do something for this monk. And so he went to the monastery and talked to the abbot, and he said, quote, We must, we must come to the aid of this monk as far as possible so that he can escape the chastisement that is due him. Therefore, Pope Gregory said, go and arrange 30 masses for his soul so that 30 consecutive days the saving victim may be offered upon the altar without fail for him. And so it was done. And a month later, the deceased monk appeared in a vision and said, I have just received pardon and release from purgatory because of the masses that were said for me. The monks did the calculation, and it was exactly 30 days. If there is truly a communion of saints, we can all help pay down the debt owed by the deceased. We can do all things in Christ. Praying for the dead is a spiritual work of mercy. It's one of the seven spiritual works of mercy. Praying for the dead. It is also merciful to visit the imprisoned, including those who are in the prison of purgatory. Canceling people's debts, especially the poor, is a good thing. And help cancel the debts of those in purgatory is a good work. Offering holy masses for their pose of souls and relatives is a wonderful thing. Visiting cemeteries, especially in the early part of November, is a highly indulgenced act. As I bring this to a close, a statue of Our Lady of Lourdes has a rosary with six decades upon it. If the waters of Lourdes can heal the bodies of the sick, why not pray just one extra decade of the rosary and give a drink to thirsty souls in purgatory and cool the fires that surround them? For those not good enough for heaven, but not bad enough for hell, there is a place, a temporary place of healing. Let us help the poor and holy souls with masses and prayers. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen.